Welcome back to the Story of Light, where I take a deep dive into the lighting developments that shaped our modern world. In the previous videos, I talked about gas lighting technologies, which were used as street lights in the 1800s. There are only a few remaining gas lighting installations left in the world. The rest of the videos in this series will cover electric lighting technologies. Most people probably think of the incandescent light bulb as the first electric light. But it turns out there was another electric lighting technology developed and commercialized decades before incandescent. That technology is the carbon arc lamp. Sometime between 1802 and 1809, Sir Humphrey Davy invented the concept of the carbon arc lamp. For his experiment, Davy used a 2000 cell battery connected to two charcoal electrodes. He left a 4 inch air gap between the two electrodes, and what we would now call an arc formed between them. Sir Davy coined the term arch lamp because of the spark formed between the two electrodes. It would take decades before this experiment would become a commercial reality. Part of the problem was a lack of stable electricity coupled with a high power demand. While batteries were a viable technology throughout the 19th century, it took many of them to create a stable arc. However, Generators, which turned motion into electricity, became viable in the 1870s. The first popular carbon arc lamp was the Obloshkov candle, developed by the Russian engineer Pavel Obloshkov in Paris. It was demonstrated publicly in 1876, and the first commercial installation of the Obloshkov candle was in the Galerie de Louvre department store in 1877. The following year, candles were installed as outdoor illumination in Paris and London. Werner von Siemens struck a deal with Jabloshkov to distribute the candles in Germany, in exchange for generators. Within a few years, Jabloshkov candles could be found throughout Europe. The technology even spread as far as Mexico City, Calcutta, and the palace of the King of Cambodia. At the height of their popularity, around 8,000 candles were manufactured in France each day. The Russian government persuaded Yabloshkov to return home and to spread the technology there, but in Russia it ended up being a commercial failure. Apparently, Russians preferred their gas lights. In the US, an engineer named Charles F. Brush had been working on a generator specifically meant to power arc lights. One of his first installations was in Public Square in Cleveland, Ohio in 1879. By 1881, the brush arc light systems were found in factories, stores, parks, and other locations in cities across the US. Because carbon arc lamps emitted exceptionally intense, harsh light, they were too bright to be practical at street level. Instead, they were well suited to lighting up large areas. Cities across the US and Europe installed so-called moonlight towers to light up multiple blocks at a time. Detroit had one of the most extensive installations of moonlight towers. Installation began in 1882, and the project had 122 towers reaching up to 175 feet in height. The arc lights atop the towers had to be maintained daily. Austin, Texas was one of the last cities to adopt moonlight towers. Before the 1890s, the city had practically no street lighting. Moonlight was the only outdoor light source. In 1894, Austin purchased 31 decommissioned moonlight towers from Detroit. Even at the time, there were concerns about the bright lights causing sleeplessness. But for a city that had not yet adopted street lights, the towers changed Austin's relationship with the night forever. Today, Austin is the last city to still have moonlight towers, with 14 still in operation. However, the towers in Austin no longer use carbon arc lamps. They were converted to incandescent in the 1920s. The incandescent lights weren't as bright, but they required way less maintenance. In the 1930s, the moonlight towers were upgraded to brighter, longer lasting mercury vapor lights. Carbon arc lamps were not desirable sources of light. They were incredibly bright and harsh, meaning they were better suited to installation hundreds of feet in the air. But they also required daily maintenance, which was challenging at such great heights. While they were cheaper than gas lights to install, they were not cheaper to maintain. The lifetime of carbon arc lamps was short. Yabloshkov candles only lasted about two hours, although a later design allowed lamps to be restarted multiple times. 
It's hard to get an exact lifetime of these lamps, but it was likely only in the tens of hours max, shorter than a gas mantle could last without maintenance. Brush's lamps were known to burn for twice as long as the Yabloshkov candles, possibly with more maintenance, although I was unable to get an exact lifetime figure. Arc lights also produced a buzzing or hissing noise, again making them better suited for mounting at a distance. Interestingly, Nikola Tesla filed a patent for an alternator that would reduce the hissing sound of these lamps. There were a few other concerns. The lights would drop hot ashes from the burning electrodes. The sparks and high temperatures meant that they were a fire hazard, and other concerns included flicker, UV light, and carbon monoxide. It's quite easy to see that once other light technologies became viable, the carbon arc lamps were decommissioned. While there are no remaining examples of carbon arc lighting today, other than for specialty applications, these lamps changed our relationship with light in several key ways. For one, they were one of the first technologies that relied on electricity propelling the commercialization of electric generators and transmission grids. Second, they were much brighter than the gas lighting of the time. All it took was one tower of six lights to illuminate several city blocks. They also produced a huge amount of light pollution, but hey, those were simpler times. Third, the concept of mounting a bright light on a tall pole lives on to this day in sports and highway lighting. Taking the concept even further, China is proposing putting three artificial moons in orbit around Earth. But I'm sure they have dark sky advocates on their back for that one. And finally, the concept of using an arc to generate light lives on in gas discharge lamps, which are now also referred to as arc lamps. This includes everything from low pressure fluorescent, sodium, and neon lighting, all the way up to high pressure metal halide and mercury vapor lamps. The difference is that these newer technologies all send an arc through a separate gas, while in carbon arc lamps, carbon vapor is created directly from the electrodes with no other gas involved. Unlike the last two technologies, I won't be doing a separate technical video for carbon arc lamps since they're basically non-existent today. But if you are interested in learning more, there are two great resources on Austin's Moonlight Towers. One is the 99% Invisible podcast episode, Under the Moonlight, and the second is a free documentary called The Last of the Moonlight Towers. I've got links to those, as well as some other resources in the description. In the next video, I'll cover the oldest electric lighting technology still in widespread use, the incandescent electric light bulb. Thank you so much, and I hope you have a great day. Thank you.